Hello. Um, we'll be we'll start uh, in five minutes, but before that, we have my publication ready over there. So if you are interested in our study, please pick up some and read while we're ready. Thank you. Check. Check, 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 check. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Mirza Izati, today's moderator. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to Forum Kajian Pembangunan or Development Studies Forum, otherwise known uh, as FKP. And as some of you here might know, FKV is consortium uh, consisting of various institutions in Indonesia. Collaborating with Australia National University Indonesia Project, FKP holds a series of research-based policy forums discussing research outcomes related to topical policy issues in Indonesia. We aim to bring together researchers, academics, experts, civil society, international community, as well as policymakers to discuss various issues around Indonesia policies. We hope that this forum will generate ideas to help improve Indonesia public policies. And as one of the members, this month Meru is hosting the FKP, and we will discuss six different topics within the course of four weeks, and today we'll discuss a new methodological approach to SDGs, but before I explain today's topic and introduce our panel, 
I need to remind you that this event is open for public, so um, please take care of your own belongings. And I hope this won't happen, but in the case of emergency, you can use the emergency exit over here. Uh, and please do not panic. I know it's hard to be not panic, but please do. And please do not use the elevator. Also, this event, this event will also be available for viewing via streaming at www.smeru.or.id slash streaming. Please do share with your colleagues who are not able to make it here today. And we also have prepared coffee for you over there. Uh, please help yourself. Uh, and okay, over the next two hours, we will have a presentation from our panel. Uh, which will be followed by Q&A session in which you can have a deeper discussion on the issue. And for our, our online viewers, you can drop your questions to Smeru's Twitter account at Smeru Institute or Facebook account, the Smeru Research Institute. We'll try our best to answer your burning questions. So um, today, we are pleased to welcome Peter Riedel Carr and Yulia Sugandi, our special guest from Reality Check Approach Plus team. Peter is an inter international development professional who is currently working as the team leader of RCA Plus team. Peter's specialty is RCA, in which, obviously, in which he's been working on since 2009 in Indonesia. He has led quality assured as well as participated as field, res field researchers in 10 RCA studies in Indonesia and Bangladesh. Uh, and Yulia Sugandi over here is a social development practitioner, consultant, researcher, trainer, as well as educator. Uh, and as her multiple job titles suggest, besides working as the lead researcher for the RCA team, Plus team, Yulia is also senior fellow at the Department of Community Development and Communication Sciences, Faculty of Human Ecology, Bogor Agri Agricultural University. She has carried out various interdisciplinary projects that apply mixed methods, which includes joint monitoring, evaluation, and need assessment, workshop, presentation, and publication. And Today, they will be sharing with us their expert opinion on the reality check approach and how this methodological revolution will help us understand multiple people's realities in the light of SDGs. To demonstrate how this method is applied to different contexts and distinguishes itself from other human-centered approaches in reaching inclusivity, Peter and Yulia will describe two RCA studies in Indonesia. Okay. With that, um, I ask you. I ask that you give your full attention to Peter and Yulia, and help me welcoming them to the stage. Peter and Yulia. Thank you. Jadi Kalabada Niran Nanti dan Silakan dalam bahasa Indonesia atau Champion Raja. Okay. So for the presentation today, we're looking at the multiple realities and the importance of understanding multiple realities, multiple perceptions in the light of the SDGs. And so with the commitment to leave no one behind, to try and understand different viewpoints and bring those to policymakers. And the method that we'll be looking at is the reality check approach, which we've been evolving over the last couple of years and using in different contexts. And so we look at the context for the non-poor and then also poor households and living with those families. So for the I'll just stand up as well actually. So for the structure of the presentation, first we're going to go through the SDGs and the RCA, the importance there. Um, then look a bit more at the RCA method and how it has evolved over time. Um, then two different studies. So firstly the research culture study where the RCA team were living at universities and understanding the research culture. Um, a household finance study which is living with poor families to understand their, finance, all their finances, their income expenditure and then plenty of time for discussion at the end. 
so firstly, the SDGs. So the SDGs has provided a, a global commitment for a lot more holistic, aspirational, multi-dimensional goals. Um, through the development process, there's a lot of consultations for around about three years. And within that, we need to try and ensure those consultations continue as the SDGs are being contextualized and integrated into national and subnational plans. To try and ensure that there still remains a connection to policymakers down to communities. And so the views of multiple stakeholders are taken into account to realize these SDGs locally as well. And so this is where the RCA is one of the approaches which um, aligns itself to do to this and to try and keep in touch and up to date with people's realities. So to try and ensure that the policymakers and the stakeholders in capital cities who don't have the opportunity to go to the field quite as much can still have the voices of communities um, as a conduit back to them to understand their realities. So what do the SDGs mean to people? And so to people, they mean very different things and multiple perceptions. So we take the SDG 1 about no, about no poverty. The, the term poverty itself is quite contested. And so different people have different interpretations. And so what we need to try and do is try and understand all those different interpretations and perceptions so that more nuanced, uh, relevant policies can be developed for the people. Behind also all the SDGs, there are multiple perceptions, multiple stories from community members. And so again, we need to try and understand these different viewpoints and build these into our discussions as the SDGs are being contextualized within the local context to make the programs and policies as relevant as possible for people. One approach to this is the reality check approach. So the RCA approach, um, Dr. Robert Chambers in his recent book referred to three transformation revolutions. And the reason he is saying this is again this linkage between people's voices and the community and policymakers. So to try and keep that link there so that the programs are informed by realities on the ground. Uh, some brief history, so the RCA was first developed in Bangladesh in 2007. This was on an education and health RCA, which is a five-year program. We've now done over 40 different studies in nine different countries with various different commissioners. And in Indonesia, we've had a team since 2014 established, about 40 researchers to mobilize for different studies. And we're linked into Palladium's research and M&E practice who are investing on developing the methodology further. So what is the RCA? Firstly, we're, we're living with families. So firstly, firstly we're, we're, living, we're living with rather than visiting. So we're living with families in their homes, sleeping on the floor, eating the same food, taking part in daily activities, understanding the life of that family through their eyes. So becoming detached insiders within their homes and really trying to understand the nuances of their life and as much as possible how they're experiencing day-to-day -day realities. We're also having conversations rather than interviews. So there's no, as you can see in this photograph, no structured questionnaire that we're running through. It's based on much more informal discussions and two-way discussions to try and have insightful insights in context, like situated in context. So within this setting here, this is actually in Bangladesh, and this was a study looking at the aspirations of youth. And this was by the river where they used to go and hang out on most days. And so it's hanging around, hanging around in this relaxed environment that they're used to, to have relaxed discussions about what they want to do in the future or about whatever they want to talk about. And so having that informality in the process. 
Um, we do have areas of conversation. So for the researchers, there are broad thematic areas um, which we navigate conversations around over the duration of the field, which is about one week. Also, it's, it's about the multiple perspectives, multiple realities, so no public consensus and trying to understand different viewpoints. So the viewpoints of different generations, different ethnicities, the voices least heard in the village, as well as the voices most heard. So try and not understand what the general viewpoint is, but what all the different perceptions are, to move away from this one size fits all, to having more kind of sophisticated, nuanced policies that are relevant to the people. As well as conversations, uh, we're experiencing life in the communities, observing what's happening, and learning from the people. So this study was a hygiene nutrition, a hygiene nutrition study, and as well as discussing hygiene issues, we're also seeing where the community members were washing their clothes, where they were brushing their teeth, where they were going to the toilet as well, and so. You, we'd understand stories about the public toilet within the community not being used because it was dirty, there was no running water, and the preference for going down to the river. So it's understanding the life in context. Also, we take a, a systems approach, so systems thinking, to understand the different connections and interconnections. And so rather than focusing on one small area like hygiene, we'll understand that in context, to understand it related to education, related to other aspects in their life, so to zoom out much more and see the complexity of the situations. So in terms of the method, how we've evolved, so back in, until about 2014, we were mostly living with families living in poverty. And then over the last two, two, three years, with the assistance of DFAP through the KSI program, we've evolved this method to look at other kind of stakeholders, community members, and live with frontline health service providers, with the village heads, with refugees, with academics, and with the middle class. So to try and really embrace, again, these different multiple perceptions on issues. And so within this presentation, we're going to have a look at the academics of the middle class within Yulia's research culture presentation, and then also the household finance, the more traditional people living in poverty. Selamat pagi, good morning. So, In my presentations, I will share about how the RCA applied in one of the studies led to the higher education. Yeah. A knowledge sector, Indonesia, together with the Ministry of Research, Higher Education and Technology, and uh, Academy of Science, Indonesia, and with their 16 research partner together they we have Ba'ana from KSI <laughs> together they're trying to find out uh, what are the barriers and the growth that impact on the research culture in Indonesia to find out more about how to reach good quality of research and strong and competitive economy and they've already made some diagnostic studies themselves, including from macro perspective, uh, middle until meso, but none of these studies on the individual level. And this is where RCA's added value is. So together with BAPANAS, KSI, and RISTEC DICTI, they are commissioning the RCA study for designing the future programs of support. In this study, trying to understand the opinions, perceptions, behavior, attitudes of academics, how they conduct their research within their universities, and they impact on the critical thinking, 
motivations, incentives. So, we know there are more than 3,000 universities in Indonesia. But we've done uh, research in six different universities. With 22 researchers uh, immersed for six nights, seven days for two rows. So two times six nights and seven days. Um, we chatted with 122 academics. And all together, also we chatted with people like academic uh, staff, also the families of academics, neighbors, and the context surrounding the academics work and lived. So all, all in all, 795 people. Um, among these 3,000 universities, of course, if you see, those issues, we are flagging up issues, the findings, we're flagging up issues for further studies. So these are our findings about, not, uh, I said, proposing solutions, but also providing information for further studies. So we have uh, uh, selected universities in Java and outside of Java, from private university, public university, and from the university which have status uh, needing guidance, binaan, until top university based on the parameter defined by Menristek Dikti. So we have that combined to make sure that we capture the positive deviance in our research. So this research focusing on emic perspective from the academic themselves. The findings, for instance, the motivations on individual level. The status and values are more important than the, stellar, than the salary. Uh, we found also the information about how important the remunerations and job security, uh, balancing family, work life. Mm, what happened? What should I do? So these these are some of the motivations from the academics. The preferred element of the three dharma, as you know, three dharma required the academics at university to do the research, uh, teachings, and community service. So we found that uh, some of the academics uh, prefer to do more teaching than doing research, and some others also prefer doing community service and so on. So various, you cannot find uh, everybody is like doing research. So you see in the actors levels here in the findings, I would like to show you how we manage to elicit the data, the information from actors levels and how it connected also in the uh, enabling environments with our university where they work. And also they are also another structural level which related to how they perceive and how the experience of academics doing research related to the government regulations. So there are three different layers, even though a starting point it's from the opinions, attitudes and behavior. But in analysis, we we're, we're find uh, the complexity from different level of social analysis. So on the actor of levels, we see also uh, different uh, uh, groups. So we found like junior, uh, women academics, senior academics. For junior academics, for instance, they're having little influence on the distributions of resources and determine, determining their career path, being overburdened with teaching responsibilities and additional tasks. To some of the quotes that we got from junior academics. Junior academics do the teaching while senior academics do the research. And for the women academics, also juggling family and university commitments, especially research, gender considerations at the workplace. In some cases, we found a pass over by men for promotion, special dress codes for women. And some of the women academics also are doing self exclusions. It means that they make a choice not to go to move forward with a further career. And this kind of personal reasons why. Uh, 
some people do not want to uh, apply certain program or you name it social pro uh, change processes we find also here in the research uh, priority for women academics some of them my priority is my children I do not want to get stressed out with my university job so uh, for senior academics greater expectations to publish work demand to promote the image of university administrative roles which impact on the time for the research so what do we have here we have different types of groups of academics where they come up with different challenges and also different contexts how they perceive they work at the universities so different needs of course in the actors levels what are the similarities among the, these different groups the similarities the need to have training on the research method so this regarding you are senior you're junior you are women academics everybody express the same thing about the need to have training on research method the lack of English and also nepotism and network so another layers you see about the culture uh, culture of academics within the university where they work which influence uh, everybody uh, who works in within the same universities first regarding to the disciplines hierarchy rules of behavior character buildings uh, focus on the dress code for instance leadership tra training based on um, a military leadership training at universities oh. sorry some of the examples of the dress code at universities culture of reading has been eroded lack of intel intellectual freedom critical thinking is on the marginal so those are the examples of the findings in actor levels and also at the, uh, the enabling environment where they work we found also a more in the structural level where you see they feel that 80% uh, what they do is overburdened by the administrative work this is re they refer to uh, the government's regulations 20% of other uh, other thing that they consider is important as an academics recruitment and promotion is about ticking the boxes that's a quote ever-changing regulation and administrations and cums like becoming the center of uh, activities academics activities and motivations they, they also discuss about publications infrastructures if you zoom in again in publications infrastructures for instance about the in-house journals English translations and the existence of peer review the non-existent of peer reviews so what are the similarities uh, between uh, the private and public in small universities for instance you see similarities are numbers of students and brands oriented like it's more like going into the commercializations of education of the universities that disregarding um, the the status of the university private or public but if you are small universities and in uh, private universities here the issue specifically for private university you have to ensure the revenue to meet accreditation requirement and the promotions of the university mostly are teaching over research. Uh, what about the academic activities in small universities? Uh, you see here the parallel class. This is literally parallel. Literally parallel. So you have. Uh, lectures giving uh, 
lecturing at two classes at the same time because they they do not have enough class so and they have to and she has to teach like continuously so how many classes per day already tiring and here the libraries these are the libraries turning into the exam room because it's also the uh, lack of infrastructure but these are the conditions also confirming the status described by uh, men respect dicti so there are some issues specifically for privates issues specifically for public but there are issues they share together whether you are private or public but you are a small universities um, what about uh, self-initiative so in this study I'm not going into detail about the findings but just to give you an idea is how we did the research uh, we did not only identify the challenges but as I also said earlier we make sure that positive deviance was captured and also the opportunities that, that were created by the people themselves by the actors who are involved in the social change processes also have to make sure that we capture that so what are the self initiatives that we found so it's like a seed that you need to water so if the water doesn't well the logic if the water doesn't bloom you fix the environment in which the flower eh, if the flower doesn't bloom you fix the environment in which the flower grows and not the flower itself so what are the enabling environment it shows the positive uh, first we found so many reading communities lab socio debate forum literature studies and these are scattered around small university big university private and public dis disregarding the status canteen as the best place for learning is because they couldn't find this as described earlier lack of intellectual uh, academic freedom so they create their own space and they have this really uh, engaging environment in the canteen where people can discuss uh, many topics there and also we found a culture of mentoring and networking at some university and some already uh, a few took initiative to make critical thinking as a teaching subject so here's a uh, lectures um, doing one-on-one -on -one. um, what is it guidance mentoring on critical thinking with their students so what are study implications since you study implications you cannot apply the universal model you need to uh, I said contextualize the models of uh, a strategy of interventions because not all for instance not all academics are interested in doing research and some actively prefer teaching the commercializations result in limiting times so there are different types of study implications here like for instance uh, the access toward research fund required this aiming targeting the seniority so in the study implications we're trying to address the different type of challenges for different groups and which level that you are aiming uh, for chains and how to connect it in, to connect uh, the chains intervention strategy within the actors levels within the enabling environment and also in structural level the regulations structural level regulations rules and law this is examples for study implication specifically to address the needs and challenges that women academics uh, have so there are also of course uh, challenges and opportunities for uh, all academics so you need to just identify which uh, which are the target groups that you would like to uh, be 
involve it. So it's like a seed. Have to know where water, how, how, and where, and how much water that the seed ha needs. That's it. Maybe we can continue further discussions. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move on to the other studies of household finance. So this is in the more traditional setting uh, of the RCA, um, based around the, or living with families who are living in poverty and trying to understand the money and how they use the money. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, we have some problem here. Um, while we're waiting this to fix, uh, please help yourself to have the coffee over there. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So, yeah, money is a lot more colourful than just a blank white screen. So, um, so a bit of background to the study. So, the study um, is trying to elicit the understanding of how people living in poverty perceive, handle, and manage their finances, their income, their expenses. Um, in particular, this is seen as useful because the amount of money that goes to families through social assistance programs to actually really understand people's behaviours and how they use this money, how they potentially may be saving it or what happens within the household. So the study participants, because money is quite a sensitive topic, we return to families that we've lived with before. And so we've been or stayed with for different studies. And so the rapport's already been built up there, and so you have that basis to open up conversations from the very beginning. Um, and so overall, there were 34 poor households that we were living with, um, scattered around in 11, 11 different provinces, around 2,200 people who we were having insightful conversations with. This was yeah, April, May last year, and the commissioners were KSI and DFAT, with the reference group chaired by Bapanas for this study. And the findings for this study were being uh, used by Bapanas for their national financial inclusion strategy. So feeding into that. So for the findings. So firstly, um, people perceived income as cash. And the cash is from wages or from selling. So this is something that we've seen has changed over the years as well, from when we started doing RCAs in 2009 in Indonesia. The more informal means of bartering and trading has decreased, and so farm food is no longer seen as income, or your own product is no longer seen as income, and it's really about money and the need to have money in the household. And so there was, within the communities we were staying for this study, there was, in the most remote communities in Maluku, there was still a little bit of bartering, but apart from that, it was much more about having to have the money in your house 
to be able to pay for regular expenses. And we'll have a look at those regular expenses shortly. So in, in order to have the money, there were multiple different income sources that families had. And so in all the families we stayed with, they all had at least one income source. Um, half of them had more than three. And in some families, as many as six to seven. And so it's really juggling different jobs, different means to get income, so the family can have a more constant, regular income throughout the duration of the time. So within this one here, this was in north, in central Kalimantan, actually, with one of the families that I was living with. And um, this was illegal logging that they were getting the wood for because they had tuition fees coming in for three juta to pay for the daughter who was in Ambon for the nursing school. And they needed this money straight away. And so they went out to get the illegal logging to pay to get this money to pay for that. But they had various different means to get money and access money. So the the what people really wanted is to have this regular income. And the ideal job through this is the PS type jobs. So to have that regular source of income and to have that consistent money coming into the household. Um, and there were more unpredictable aspects to the climate change, the seasonality impacts, which impacted uh, how they could get the money at certain times of the year. So either with fishing, with farming, but then also within that central Kalimantan community again, there was gold mining. And so gold mining during the rainy season was very difficult. And so in the rainy season, many of the families went pig hunting to get their income. So it's really kind of adapting to different needs at different times. So this is a depiction of the family expenditure. So across the, from all the families that were sharing their stories of us, um, as well as the discussions we were using visuals to map out kind of expenditure and income. Um, and this was be using seeds or other items around about to pr have these more insightful conversations to try and understand how people were spending their f money on a regular basis and a periodic basis. So the middle circle here are the regular expenditures and across these locations it was based around these three core expenditures which was food, cigarettes and snacks and that equating to about 60,000 rupiah per day and fairly evenly split between those three. And then in the outer room we have the periodic expenses which is uh, the some of them are linked around to life cycle changes so around sort of having a baby and the cost of uh, formula milk, um, schooling costs at various different stages of going through school and between different levels of school as well as credit payments and religion. And we'll go through these and have a look at them in a bit more detail. So firstly, for the regular expenses. So food is number one in most people's recollection of what they think is the most uh, costly item. But when it's been mapped out, it works out about the same amount as snacks and also cigarettes. But people see it as very important, obviously, you have the food on the table to make sure you have the food on the table, to make sure you have the money available to pay for your regular food for your family. Snacks. So this is the same amount of money being spent on snacks as it was for food. And this is being a growing trend that we've seen across the RCA study since 2009. So let's have a look a bit more about snacks into the packet. So, yeah, this growing trend and it replacing meals. So we're finding more and more that breakfast uh, for children is being substituted by having snacks at school rather than breakfast at home. And so, and it's partly around um, sharing the snacks with your friends, a social element of hanging out with your friends and eating together rather than sort of having breakfast cooked at home. So some families in this study, it was 1.5 to 1.8 million a month being spent on snacks. And we've seen this, this growing um, desire and pressure from children to actually 
demand to have this pocket money. And the pocket money we've also been seeing has been increasing quite a lot in the last four or five years um, to up to sort of 15,000 per day per child with some families. And this is a quote from West Java. To destroy the house. We have been in living with families also where the, the door has been kicked down by the child who hasn't received his pocket money that day. And so real pressures coming on to the parents to provide this as a, a need for the children for them to buy snacks. And then on to cigarettes, so the BAPAX pocket money, as some of them were referring to it as. Um, and so this is, is seen as again the equal proportion to food, snacks and now cigarettes in many families um, as an, or a more of a necessity for the backpack and making sure they have enough money for this. Um, in this community in central Kalimantan, as, as I went back to that community, it's quite interesting that one of the children actually given up smoking. And then he was realizing how much money he'd saved as a result of that. And so for him it was one million a month was being saved because he wasn't smoking. So as well as these three kind of regular expenses, there are some other um, regular costs coming in, on a, which aren't as much, but still do have implications. So firstly, electricity, so around about 30 to 50,000 per month. If there's a TV in a house, then obviously that goes up further. And mobile credit, so um, virtually all homes have at least one mobile phone. And a lot of discussions we're, we've been having with in, um, in other studies for children, it's not so much about if they have a mobile phone, but what type of mobile phone they have. So it's kind of, it's, it's a need for many people within communities to have this mobile phone, to link into social networks and part of that um, friendship circles. And cooking fuel. So these are other kind of regular expenses coming through that the family have to pay for. So if we look now at the, the outer ring, so at the periodic expenses that the households are paying for. So firstly, schools. So school is meant to be free, but then there's lots of other costs associated with schooling. And this has come out in a lot of the studies that we've been doing. Um, and these costs range from 900,000 all the way up to 3.6 million per child per year, which is approximately three months salary or is approximately one year's cost for the food for the family. And these are coming from free schools. So what are these costs? These costs are associated, um, the largest costs being school fees and registration costs, going between different grades of school from SA to SMP and up to SMA. Um, as well as the registration ones. Then there's the uniform costs, um, which up to five uniforms per child, and that um, we've seen from many of the studies being quite a burden on a lot of families. They have to have these uniforms. Um, school maintenance costs, um, teachers' gifts being asked for, uh, photocopying, the list goes on. The list, there's a lot of different costs here, but it does add up to considerable amounts of money that is required at periodic times for the family to spend on schooling. Then we have um, the other life cycle one is around having a baby. So this is a quote from one of the mothers about how after having a baby a lot more expenses came along. And those expenses being firstly the formula milk and the um, kind of demands also for formula, we formula milk and the lack of exclusive breastfeeding and the implications of advertising and other social pressures to see that formula milk is better for you and will help your baby grow. As a result, a lot of um, mothers changing to formula milk very soon and the cost of obviously of that associated is quite high. And so this is between 250,000 to 300,000 per month being spent on formula milk. And then as well as that, there's um, not being able to work. So 
if the mother was working beforehand or the father, they're not being able to work um, after the baby's been born. So the loss of income through that. Then in a lot of the communities, there were social pressures and social pressures linked to um, the church, the mosque, um, asking for periodic expenses to be paid and contributions. Um, so this was in Maluku, one of the mothers, um, sharing that the church should be supporting them, but rather than demanding money. And in this community, this is well, one of the donation boxes, but they also re um, announced every week whose birthday it was, and you'd have to pay 10,000 to have your, um, your birthday announced, which is, but they, what they would also do is then um, give warning about whose birthday is coming the week after. And so if you didn't pay that 10,000, people would know, like, or you, you had been announced that you were going to have your birthday two weeks before, but then when that week came along, your birthday wasn't being announced, so you hadn't paid your 10,000. So it's kind of a way of publicly shaming people if you, if you don't pay to have your birthday announced. You could apply that as well, yeah. <laughs> Get some additional funding. Um, and then this is, this is a, related to the mosque um, in a different community. But quite a lot of social pressures in a lot of the communities around um, needing to and obligated to contribute um, to religious institutions. Then there's uh, good sport on credit. So within this photograph, most of the items there you can see have been bought on credit. So you've got the, the TV, the fan, the... Um, very big speakers there as well, as well as the bed. And so a lot of items bought on credit and the majority of the families that we were living with um, had some formal or informal um, ongoing credit arrangements, so regular repayments having to be made. For goods bought on credit, it was seen as quite a safe option though, and an easier option than cash loans, which we'll look at afterwards. The reason being because if you can't make that payment, then the goods can just be taken away. And so they'll be taken back by whoever provided that good. Whereas cash is a bit more complicated. If you don't, you can't pay it and you haven't got the cash, then it's more problematic. And this is a collector coming to try and get some cash repayment and the public shaming that people felt around debt. Um, around if their neighbours saw this debt collector coming and they couldn't repay, that they felt um, very, um, very not willing to make these types of risks in the community if they were going to take some money out. Especially because of the irregular nature of incomes and the seasonal nature of that, to have to make regular monthly cash payments or weekly cash payments could be troublesome. So, as summed up here, it's better to sell the assets rather than to actually borrow the money, the cash. So, in terms of savings, in terms of what families perceived about savings and also their behaviours around savings. So, one third of the families had no cash savings at all. Um, and the families that did have cash savings, it was mostly kept in the purse by the mother of the family who is managing the day-to-day -day finances of that family in virtually all cases. And then the father will be asking for his regular cigarette money, his pocket money um, from the mother. In terms of banks, only three families were using a bank um, and the reason being it was seen as remote but this is not just from a distance point of view but also psychologically. The kind of processes you have to go through to set up a bank account um, kind of detracted people away from that for those formal processes. How banks were being used were mostly for remittance money, for receiving remittance money. And also we've seen growingly in more recent times for social assistance also in some communities actually the the need to set up bank accounts to receive some social assistance. So there is some changes happening there. 
So if, where else would they be saving their money or saving their income? Chickens. Or rather, if, if the bank is too formal, then it's more ways which are easily liquefiable assets also. So chickens, goats, pigs, as a means to, if you have additional cash to invest in, and then when one of those periodic costs come along, such as school tuition fees, then you can sell that good to provide that money for the income for that. As well as that, a common one was gold. So gold can easily be exchanged later. And so families investing in gold, and then when they needed that money, they could sell that gold if need be. So some key points that we learned from this study. Firstly, cash, money, is really important now. So to actually have money in hand, and particularly for the regular expenses, to have that on a regular basis, and the need for regular income. And related to that, um, having these different multiple sources to receive this income in different ways, to try and make it less unpredictable, the amount of money you're receiving. The costs around the family life cycles, so around um, having a newborn baby, then also different stages at schooling, there's high costs around those, and so some, um, some need to actually have additional income at those times. The women in the household, they're the ones who are managing the money, and that was pretty uniform across all the households. Um, they weren't easy way or easy ways to access the savings, so very tangible ways, um, if it's through gold or through livestock, so they can access the money straight away when they need to, rather than through the formal financial services, such as banks, being seen as a bit too scary, a bit too formal, um, complex in the systems to actually set up the accounts. And this um, adversity to debt and to having um, taking out cash loans and having these regular repayments, um, partly around being scared to make that payment, but then also the shame they can feel from their community members by being in debt and it visibly being seen to other neighbours. So those are the two case studies that we'll go through today. There's a couple of concluding comments around about the whole RCA and those two case studies, then we can have a discussion. So firstly, the um, around the SDGs and leave no one behind, the need to really embrace uh, multiple perspectives and multiple realities and find ways to do this. So everyone's views being heard and listened to. And the RCA here we've illustrated is one of the methods that can do this. And we've used it in different contexts now. So from living with house or families in poverty to also the research culture, which is a very different context. And what the RCA is aiming to do is also transform the C field you know, towards a C field change. So they're trying to connect policy makers to understand um, communities' experiences, what their perceptions are, what they're feeling and so more informed, nuanced policies can be made. And then to, as particular as the SDGs are um, being contextualized into the national and sub-national con context, to try and embrace these multiple perceptions to ensure the policies and SDGs are aligned to people, people's realities and people's needs which would lead to the more inclusive and relevant programs for people. Okay, Terry McCassie. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Yulia. So that is the reality check approach. Uh, Peter and Yulia have talked about the how RCA help link people's voices to the policymakers because there is no one intervention fits all, right? So uh, they also um, explain that there are two RCA studies in higher education 
and home finances. Um, looking at the time we have left, uh, I think we could have like three rounds of Q&A. So in the first round, we will address three questions. Um, and yeah, I will start directly. Can you please your hands? Raise your hands, sorry. Okay, one, two, and three. You can have them. Uh, can I have the microphone? First one. Thank you. Um, perkenalkan, nama saya Wira dari Pusat Kebijakan dan Manajemen Kesehatan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Gajah Mada. Um, I have question uh, related to your presentation uh, for Peter. Um, I think this is very new for me, the reality check approach, and this is very interesting. I can see some uh, important uh, message that we can take from, uh, from the people. Um, this is a specific question related to your study. Um, I didn't see any um, allocation for health uh, in, in among the people that uh, you have uh, been uh, involved with. Is it because of our health system or our uh, JKN, uh, Jaminan Kesehatan Nasional, is very good that people doesn't have to really spend money anymore? Or is it because they don't really think about it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Makalo, uh, working for the UNFPA, United Nations Population Fund. Uh, I have two questions here. One is directed to the first presenter, Bu Yulia. Uh, yeah, one of yes, one of uh, your observations, especially among the senior uh, academician, um, revealing that uh, one of the burden is the cum, uh, collecting the cum. Um, have you uh, done any further observations uh, um, of the cum here, which one of the sources is through the research? Uh, whether the research is actually uh, uh, useful for contribution to the knowledge, or the research that they've, they've been doing is only to fulfill the requirement of the cum? Uh, that is the first question. The second is, um, my question is directed to Peter. It's interesting to note that uh, there has been an increase in consumption of snacks, re replacing the food. Uh, have you done any further observation why it happens? Like uh, what type of foods is being served in the household? And uh, whether they are just merely traditional food uh, and what's the role of what you call some stuff like MSGs, you know, in this in this case? Because um, in many cases, snacks actually how to attract you know the children to consume snacks, they uh, you know use MSGs so it becomes tasty. So because of tasty, they they they, they are more attracted to uh, to, to uh, you know consume snacks rather than ordinary food. Uh, being served at home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Harvey. Harry uh, Seldadio. Um, I was trying to understand the structure of logic of your presentation and on RCA. Um, number one, uh, you display some figures. Started from some hundred people as a sources of information and even 2,000 people um, as a sources of information. Then some keywords on the reality check, um, um, multiple perspective. But then we come up with, say for example, in a women group, there's only one perspective. 
they don't want to pursue more career on academic. And you display some figures on some people on average spend on some amount of money on cigarettes paying more. That's to me it's only one figure, one one perspective you just um, 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 present. Then my question is that when you told us about multiple perspective and you have thousands of sources of information, how did you average or aggregate in terms of collective techniques that to come up with this one single uh, perspective? Then where is basically the the multiple the, and what kind of reality you check? Do, did you have a, in your mind a kind of hypothesis or something? Because if we compare, for example, on the Sessionas data, all the you know information you display there in an, in the presentation, and we we know it. Even we have exact number, exactly. We can divide into some groups, and we have more much more information from Sessionas, for example. So that one one perspective, uh, one one comparison. If we go further to say, for example, on the a very anthropological point of view, we live with people, we, we are part of people, then we have much more information. So, we think it's too extreme. Where is your position? When you try to sell the idea of real check, thousands of sources of information, and the multiple perspective. That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, firstly, to Pat Weirin, uh about the for the health costs. So, um, health health costs would probably come within the periodic ones at different times and not be within the regular expenses. We, we have done studies actually where we've been living with frontline health service providers to actually understand how people um, in or related to the Puskas mass and if they were buying kind of the free medicine of Puskas mass. Um, and quite often it would be because of the cues and the perception on lower quality of the medicine the Puskas mass, people would be buying it still outside at the kiosk or other areas. Um, but related to how planning around it, it wouldn't be a cost that people would be so much planning around. It's more when they when they have this health emergency to actually try and sell some of these um, assets they may have to try and produce the, the funds to support that. Um, but yeah, th there is a study which I can happily share with you, sort of which goes into a lot more depth about people's perceptions around um, using the Puskas Mass, the, the services provided by the Puskas Mass, and how they're linking up with their, their health concerns. Yeah. Um, to, to Richard, so in terms of the... I'll, I'll cover the snacks first. So... Um, yeah, it's tasty. There's MSG, and so that, that's attracting people or children to the snacks. I think another key element is, is the social aspect, and so it's a uh, part of a social need at school to be buying snacks and sharing with your friends. And if you're not within that circle, you're being excluded. Um, but then also because of this, the busier lives, the multiple incomes that families have that at home parents are busier circulating around trying to maybe out in the morning when they're doing the illegal logging or something and so there's less food available um, at home being cooked at home. Um, we have done some studies on this as well so um, a recent one with UNICEF um, which is looking a lot more at the snacking culture for teenagers and the reasons behind that and these are some of the aspects around that as well. So happy to also share that study with you. Do you want to discuss the cum? So, uh, about the cum and how it's perceived by different uh, groups of academics. For the senior academics, indeed, they have the opportunities to choose. They have opportunities to choose uh, to go for research rather than teaching because it can give them more points for cums. But for junior academics, it's also as they describe, uh, the compositions for teaching is bigger than doing research. So that's the different uh, the opportunities that provided for different groups. But for the whole Disregarding uh, senior, junior women academics, 
Kum it is it, it, it is the center of academic activities and one of the driver of the motivations for uh, academics doing their um, like academic work. Only the different how it perceive and how it make a choice it relates to their status and also opportunities provided for them. I hope it's clear. And for uh, rigor, I think your questions related to rigor. So, uh, how we perceive multiple perspectives and doing immersions. So, um, of course, uh, we don't call it RCA as a really ethnographic research because of ethnographic research that you have to stay longer, you have to do to learn the language of the local people, to immerse in certain period of times, and I think we are uh, labeled as a light touch of ethnographic research, but more into like listening skills. So first is listening skills, and second, all the researchers they have to be aware of power relations during the research, power relations between the researcher and the study participants, or the power relations among the participants themselves. So we take into consideration how you present yourselves as a researcher, like make it like really as humble as possible, uh, because of the like Peter already describes the context of informality and comfortness to be engaged in the meaningful, insightful conversations. That's the key. So you get a, a relaxed environment where people also build on trust. And we're doing also participants' observations. So not only uh, report what you see and write it, but also experiencing, experiencing yourself. Uh, that will be also the added value. Uh, another uh, things maybe about the rigor. Rigor, is, see, maybe you can show the diagram of rigor. Do I have that? So the 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 triangle, the the timings. You see, because we stay there, like during the day and the night. Um, and also the how do we have managed to embrace multiple uh, perspectives because we bring about the context and not on the focus on the sectoral issues. So if we stay with one family, we also converse with the family and the neighbors, and also uh, like in my study, for instance, converse also with the universities. Uh, staff and including non-academic staff, so make sure also that's like a uh, positive deviance being captured. Um, how do uh, you mention about the different range of groups, women's academics, and that could be also broken down if you zoom into what kind of challenges and not all women academics also have the same face. Uh, there are some women academics who prefer to like prioritize the family, mostly, majority, but there are also who are, have really high motivations to pursue their mobility, the career mobility. So we need also to identify certain challenges faced by certain uh, people who are in certain groups. Uh, so different kind of challenges, so we don't see it like women academic on the same face. So to zoom into more, into different type of uh, study participants and context, deep, deep, rich context into different uh, groups involved. Have next, clear. So, and also that you made a very good point about how we're saying multiple perceptions, multiple perspectives, but then when it comes down to the presentation, there's, there's numbers, there's one person said this. Um, that That's, a difficulty, I suppose, of trying to condense things into 20-minute presentations. Like within the um, in the study reports, you see there's a lot more uh, box stories, narratives from different viewpoints around the same topic. And so, within these presentations, we're trying to summarise it to give the overall flavour. And around some of that household finances, there are lots of different um, ideas and viewpoints about what income is. But then, if 
overall it's seen as cash and that's kind of an overall perception we're trying to say but yeah it is tricky because the whole emphasis behind the RCA is to try and not generalize to try and embrace different viewpoints and so um, within more lengthy discussions that's where we would have the opportunity to kind of give different viewpoints around the same thematic area um, but yeah within 20 30 minute presentations it's, it's harder to do that The hypothesis because it's grounded theory. Grounded reason. Um, so, can you explain a bit more what you mean by grounded theory? So, you came to the uh, field with no set of questions, or you already have like the aims, but like you will see what kind of question will arise on the field. Can you explain? I think yes, here we have these areas of conversations, and of course, before going to the field, we have to study. We have the study designs, also the background of the study. We have that, the references and literatures. But we don't have the specific questions because we are trying to embrace the context and complexity of the context. So areas of conversations, only the guidelines for us to be engaged in the insightful conversations. So, but the grounded uh, theory means that's here, like framework analysis. So there are four step different framework analysis, but don't do the last one, interpretations, because we are trying to distance ourselves from giving interpretations and let the context fix for itself. Okay, uh, before we go to the next round, uh, maybe some of you are like, curious about this. Like, you say that you want to have them relax, as relaxed as possible, but you know, you've, you've, you were there like for few, few, few days. So how you, like, make them feel relaxed and act, act as usual I mean like for I'm sorry but like you're a foreigner and a stranger come there and then there was like oh I'm being observed how how make them like act as as they are on a normal days yes, I, I think the key is uh, so that they don't feel like they're being so much observed but you're you're really taking part in the day-to-day -day life of the family and so um, taking part in if it's the cooking, the um, going to hunting, farming, um, taking an interest in their life and within the first couple of days you're really just trying to get to know each other. You're not having discussions about household finance or about incomes and stuff. But you're getting to know people as people first and breaking down those power kind of imbalances. Um, one way I found is really good is actually just making a fool of yourself quite quickly. And so I remember one of the last communities we were playing volleyball, and I was awful about volleyball. And so by being there and taking part in activities and showing that um, you're there to learn, you're there to understand, you're there to engage on their daily activities, and things won't be changed by your presence, and you're really insist that from the very beginning and it's, it's difficult people do want you to be a visitor they do want you to have special treatment you have to go over and over and over again saying we want to understand the life or your daily life and not a special arrangement for four or five days um, and in the end yeah, pe people do get it and it takes time at the beginning to break down those barriers break down the kind of power dif or differentiations um, you do end up having a lot more relaxed, informal, open discussions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next round we'll also have uh, three questions. Asep, um, and Miss. Thank you for very enlightening presentation. Uh, I'm Asep from Semeru. I uh, would like to ask two questions. The first one uh, to Peter. So I see that your studies were commissioned by government ministries. So I presume that the findings of the study are used for policy purposes. Uh, in our experience, when whenever we uh, present the results of our studies using qualitative approach, that always 
arises questions such as, is this Indonesia how representative is your study? Questions like that, yeah. Because of that, now we try as much as possible whenever we do a study, when the budget permit, we use a mixed method. So we use both uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, approaches. So I'm just wondering whether uh, reality checks approach can also be combined with quantitative uh, study and if yes, uh, has it been uh, tried uh, anywhere and what, what is the, the finding from the quantitative, from the mixed method? Uh, my second question to Bu Yulia. So, uh, I didn't realize that there are so many research conducted at the universities. Yeah. Uh, do you have a feel about the quality of this uh, research? Yeah? And where do this research end up? Yeah? Uh, do they go to uh, literature? And is it used for policy, policy for purposes? Terima kasih. Nama saya Sentot, saya dari Kompak, uh, Pfizer. Uh, Peter, uh, you mentioned that, or did you mention that uh, the households that you you surveyed are the receiver of social protection program? Um, so I'm interested to see, because you only uh, present us the, the, the spending, uh, household spending uh, from their cash income. But didn't you ask questions like how many times they use their social protection cards to fulfill their different needs, maybe using KIP, using case or Kartutani? And I wish you, you as, as well whether the, the money that went to the village now, the, you know, the village transfer also uh, creates uh, additional income uh, from working at the village projects. Uh, you know, because it has been three years since the village uh, law implementation. So if you haven't done that, I think this should be uh, an interesting subject as well, whether village law creates additional income especially at the rural area, of course. Um, uh, Ibu Yulia, um, I've been away too long from campus life, but so it's really interesting. Um, but also, I, I had many concerns that uh, the, the culture of reading, even in, the, in campus, also decreasing. Um, but well, I'm interesting whether the the relationships between students and and teachers now different from before. I suspect maybe different. When you said that canteen is a good place for people to learn and and interact, whether teacher also sit there, the lecturer also sits, sits there with the students often, or just students, and maybe the lecturers. Uh, feel better to spend their time in coffee and thank you both. Um, hi, I'm Kim, also from Compaq. And my question is similar on long similar lines. So you're using the research to think about providing various perspectives to policymakers. So how do you help them understand and appropriately consume this research? So they don't see it and say, okay, this represents all of Indonesia, so we're going to base policy on the findings from a study with 34 families. I think that is an interesting tension of how do you share this, because it's really interesting and provides interesting information, but what do policymakers really need to do with it? And then the university study, just I thought it was fascinating how challenges that you identified are so similar to those at in universities across the U.S., which was a little surprise to me. And just wondering if 
students are involved in the research process as well. So do they have research associate or research assistantships? Are they, is part of the mission in addition to doing research is building future researchers with your student population? Um, yes, yeah, so firstly, yeah, thank you for the question. So for Pak Asset about the um, mixed methods approach. So that, yeah, that, this is an area that we're, we've moved towards in the last couple of years. Um, we're, we're doing mix, or current mixed method studies uh, internationally. So in Nepal and Ghana, and these are, these are longitudinal studies. And so the, the survey team and the RCA qualitative team um, go back on a regular basis to try and um, or the one in in Nepal is about rural access, the rural access program to try and understand how the road construction program has impacted the communities from the numbers of people using the road, but then also their perceptions around um, what that means to them, what the, their experiences are. So that we do, there's mixed methods workshops that we conduct, and so the two teams sit together, the quant and the qual, um, to really um, dig deeper into the findings and to or jointly share the findings and try and really understand the, the numbers in more depth with the stories but then also um, cross-check some of the stories with some of the numbers and so it's used more as a interpretive lens. Um, in Indonesia we've been doing where what we're trying to do more and more is trying to integrate the mixed methods from the very beginning. So we have done some studies where we've complemented some quantitative survey work being done, but not from the very beginning being designed together. And so we're trying to, um, the proposals we're aligning towards now for commissioning is more trying to actually get them designed from the very beginning so we can see how they can inform one another across the process. Um, and we, we have done a couple of less integrated ones, but that's the model we're moving towards. And we have been also doing some of, some of that ideas and thinking behind the mixed methods as training, training for commissioners um, for, or in the ballot bands and also for other commissioners from government side. Um, so for, yeah, Pat sent up the yeah, social assistance, social protection, income, yes, that we did cover this within that study. Um, and it's seen as, um, and we've done a lot of other studies on social assistance, so we were um, working with Tempe de Waka a lot um, in between 2014, 15, and did several studies there. And so, um, in general, the, the social assistance money is seen as not much, not a large contribution, um, and a nice addition but not a significant amount that's going to make a big imp or impact on their um, family income. Um, and there's different ways people, or different perceptions we have around the different social assistance programs from the, um, the conditionalities or the um, lack of understanding around conditionalities. So there's, there's a lot of insights we do have around that, which um, are covered, I suppose, in other studies, but then also within that household finance one. But uh, yeah, within that, 20 minutes slot, I didn't draw so much onto the social assistance side. Um, do you want to answer that since that's other question? Um, and then also for Kim, in terms of how yeah, how to engage the policy makers, um, I think it's in different forums. So there, there's the, there's, there is the presentation, which you do have to distill information down and people get segments and snapshots and we, we do want to reflect the multiple realities, multiple perceptions, and so we we then try and have more informal discussions, which would last for a lot longer to go into the details, um, and more so now to try and build this into the dissemination process. So at the very end of programs, to actually have these type of workshops where we sit down and actually go through um, the findings and what people are being saying, but then try and help to make some interpretations there as well. So the RCA, we, we deliberately try not to um, put our technical lens on and actually inform or make, make recommendations, but we're thinking more, more so to try and have these type of forums, discussions with programs and policy makers to facilitate that process. 
um, so that um, more tangible policy implications can be made and not just off, off a 40 or a brief presentation where you're pulling bits out. Yeah. Uh, I said about publications or literature. It's publications made by the academics, what you mean, at the universities, yeah. Uh, I described earlier about the inf publication infrastructure. There's so many also in-house journals within the universities. Uh, we found also um, most of these journals are like a fee review. So like in one university, uh, they have journals and they over the other universities as the work writers. They do also exchange kind of speak journals. So the circulations of the knowledge disseminations not good public, but among this the writers of the journals. Um, there are also other publications, but mostly on the based on the consultancy work, more practical. And if you would like to, some of the center academics who would like to make into the international journal publications, as also described uh, uh, earlier, it's related to the English translations in editorial. It's not included in the budget to make like a, a good uh, international uh, publications. It's corpus index, make it there, yeah. Well, the publications, the research. Uh, we didn't go into examine the quality of the research, but more into how such research is being done and what was the motivations and environment uh, surrounding the research is carried out. Mm, like mostly, for instance, for the research, uh, done by the senior academics is always like uh, giving a choice between uh, you do the research. They are passionate researchers. We found also some passionate researchers who are really doing uh, really proper research. But there are also some researchers who choose more into like doing consultancy and even for private sectors an expert and they prefer that uh, in, in our report it's mentioned they prefer that because of the less administrative burdens. So what I described uh, just 80% for the administrations, 20% for other things that we consider are important. So most of the major challenges are first administrations and second is uh, also time time constraints of doing the research and also un from doing research until reporting. Uh, and the third is also uh, how is the economic benefits from doing such a research. So we found, uh, identify what are the elements that influence certain uh, lectures make decisions not doing research with this and then prefer to do the research is more on practical levels. Um, not, not doing like a really solid, as it mentions, by confirming KSI finding also. No? Research for like really solid research for knowledge, but more on practical research. Um, for the informal settings, the learning outside of the formal settings. In the formal settings, the relations between the lectures and the students, as also mentioned in the report, in the formal settings also very formal in a very hierarchical way. So you see like the horizontal, horizontal inequalities, so to speak, horizontal inequalities among the lectures and also between the lectures and also the students. And the report also mentions about, for instance, the, uh, the, the uh, one WhatsApp one instructions how to send the WhatsApp to a lecture. This is in big university, pa. So you need to say SOP, pa. <laughs> SOP how to send a WhatsApp 
to a lecture what you should say you should do how it's really code of conduct and like uh, if you see uh, in bright presentation the character buildings mentioned about the code of conduct dress code and those who are also reflect reflecting in the relations between the uh, lectures and the students also kissing hands for instance a sign of respect so the very inherical manners and code of conduct so to speak the character building but the interesting part we found that in order to able to get the shared informal learning process between uh, lectures and students and different groups the interesting part is when uh, they are part of the um, so to speak the degree of the vulnerability so it, when you are in the this position when you are able to choose in your academics uh, a work then you tend to have like really higher gap b between the others but when you have less opportunities and space to to choose to do to, to choose in terms of doing your academic work then the gap is lower so you see that for instance the or or even if you're a senior lectures for instance but you have no space for uh, exercising your intellectual freedom we found even though uh, they are senior lectures they have like lower uh, gap they are part of these informal settings they call it like creating like kind of uh, pengajian but it's not pengajian of that it's literature study so uh, we found also some lectures like that so it depends on how your positions your your vulnerability level in your working space it de it, it determines your closeness social cohesion so to speak <laughs> between lectures and students that we found at Bama. Uh, about uh, students and the lectures this is absolutely interesting uh, we found of course positive deviance like if you uh, remember from my descriptions also networks and nepotism so it could be very good you, uh, it depends on who you know not only what you know who you know in some university there's a really good um, strong mentoring culture where they have this okay we provide a space for you to 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 have your academic career and so on and so forth but uh, in some other universities not in the network but nepotism and that's it's really blocks the junior or even uh, students who would like to move forward with their academic careers and some cases we find for instance uh, fresh graduates they would like to be a lecturer then they call it assistants uh, lectures but they're not yet a lecturer because their problem also gaining a status um, they're becoming not involved in the academic activities but the status as a backup so so this particular lectures for instance come to the uh, to the university almost every day to be on call just in case some uh, more senior lectures are not available and in some particular cases for instance unavailable because of their women academic their children's got sick so they could not come so something like that and so they back it up by this junior uh, junior lectures so they are we also discuss about this status status how uh, how you call yourself we ask such uh, lectures would you call yourself assistant lectures or would you call yourself also assistant researchers and the answer is well we are the backup we are <laughs> the on call lectures so yeah so i think we provide also uh, more formal, formal kind of structure way to accommodate 
also and also at the same time this structural uh, regulations also improve at the same time we also pay attention on the culture so regulations and the culture relate to the either nepotisms or network I think we are able to accommodate uh, such potentials uh, juniors Okay, um, I think we have like around 10 minutes left, so the last round of Q&A will only address two questions. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Fiona. I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. Um, my question is somewhat related to the previous uh, two questions about uh, engaging with policymakers. Um, uh, I was just wondering to what extent um, their realities is being checked. I mean, like to engage uh, with policymakers, obviously we need to better understand how they work, how they think about their per their, their perspective. So I was just wondering, uh, is there any study that include them as study participant uh, within the RCA method? Thank you. Hello, you can say by Indonesia. <laughs> Peter, mungkin bisa, uh, saya Matias, saya penulis blog. Saya mau tanyain tadi kan uh, Peter bilangnya tentang biaya rumah-rumah uh, 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 apa ya? Mungkin saya cuma mau tahu apakah dalam buku orangnya ada yang buat di kota urbanisasi, ya, maksudnya di pinggir-pinggir kota gitu yang biaya uh, hidup mereka apa sudah ada juga. Buat Julian mungkin yang saya mau tanya tadi mungkin sudah dibicarain tapi saya mau tahu kan ada pekerti ya saya lihat di laporannya ada pekerti juga buat junior itu supaya um, uh, ya mungkin salah satu yang saya mau nanyain itu yang mungkin yang sudah lama jadi dosen apakah setiap tahun dikompulsorikan juga harus uh, bikin makalah melalui asistennya, uh, melalui jalur pekerti atau ada begitu. Dan bagaimana mungkin solusinya yang nepotism itu ya, mungkinnya salah satu budayanya supaya ya mungkinnya dress code apa itu bisa, mungkin ada solusi enggak gitu. So yeah, for yeah, Fiona, um, for the working or understanding policymakers we we have at the very very at the village level so from the point of view for village leaders so the village uh, law study we were living with the village heads with the sectes with bepede members as well as living with wider community members to try and understand different perceptions around village law um, and we have also been thinking about and we were discussing previously with with DFED about doing some organizational ethnography. So actually trying to live also within district offices and trying to understand the day-to-day -day life of what happens within district office, which would be fascinating. <laughs> um, there, there would be different challenges, obviously, and that's what we've been trying to experiment with the last couple of years about doing the RCA within different contexts and how you have to slightly adapt the methodology within those different contexts to be more or more likely around kind of shadowing rather than directly living with policy makers um, and a challenge would also be to try and have that those informal discussions or the informal settings for those discussions um, which is one of the challenges actually within the research study trying to actually find spaces and times to have more open discussions um, but yeah it would be fascinating to try and understand also from the policy makers perspective what their challenges are how they um, what their day-to-day -day experiences are and how they relate to people's realities to try and bring the perspective the other way as well um, for Matthias the the household finance study was mostly in rural locations um, for that study um, but we have also done other studies within urban context um, and we're uh, about to do a study with the World Bank on urban poverty so to actually understand the different natures of poverty within urban locations and also the migration, the rural to urban migration um, but yeah this, this study was mostly in rural locations 
does that answer that question fully or Tentang pekerti ya Pak Matias about pekerti. Uh, in all of our research, the same also when uh, related to Pak Asep's questions, uh, we get, uh, we found like the elements that influence the research, the quality of research, and how people can make a choice, uh, go for go for um, uh, the research that they would like to do. And what are the constraints and also uh, challenges, uh, opportunities are there? Uh, related to also solutions, the same also, we are not providing solutions. So in study implications, mostly we are just, uh, how is it like, bring about, bring about the perspective from the people. Uh, it's, it's also related to our perspective of theory of change. So we provide also the space for, for the people to speak uh, themselves. So in study implication also uh, based on that. Um, here also mentions about the Pekerti and how the training is already conducted uh, and how the academics perceive uh, such training. But for them, like also described in my earlier presentations, the main needs for them is to the need to do the uh, research uh, uh, training uh, method, a uh, research method, training in the research method. So that's all. And how is it related to like technicals? Some of them, if you mention, say like it's too technical, it's not directly related to the academic world. Uh, you can also find it in the, in the report how they perceive the Pukerti and such uh, training conducted to them. Okay, thank you. So, because there is not much uh, time left uh, and we have the lunch ready, so I sadly have to end our session today here. Uh, but you both will be here over the lunch so you can have a discussion with them after this. Uh, but before we officially end this discussion, um, can you please let us know what is the most interesting point that came from this discussion for you? From um, yeah, I found it the uh, it's useful food for thought. I think it's, it's become as or well, in the same way as an RCA, kind of a two-way discussion conversation and the idea about the we do talk about multiple perceptions and then the way we portray it is a challenge if we're trying to summarize things down into presentations then we are coming up with overarching generalizations which is kind of going against what we're trying to illustrate and so that that is a challenge for us to work through um, I think one way um, will be through the mixed methods approach, so to actually working with on the mixed methods. So the RCA is is a complement to other research methods; it's not a standalone, and so it can be used to inform and understand some of the data in different ways. Um, and then the other way of trying to work more closely with the policymakers or the programs after the studies, so it's not just a one-off presentation and the generalizable findings are taken away, but then the, the details, the stories, the nuances are also understood by policymakers, and it's contextually understood about where these locations were, what the realities in those situations were, to so that kind of extrapolated conclusions aren't drawn too hastily from one study. It reminds me also of Asep's questions. Have we addressed Asep's questions about the mixed method? Have we done? I think what is the most important for me, the insightful uh, topic, is the human center approach in viewing social change processes is still a long way to go. <laughs> okay. Okay, then. Um, Okay, that finally brings us to the end of the event, but please first let me give you a summary of what we have discussed over the last two hours. So, 
We have known that the RCA will help us understand the multiple realities in people's life, that there is no one size fits all. And then Yulia and Peter has described their two studies on higher education and home finances. And during the discussion, they also uh, give more information how they collected the um, how they collected the information, uh, the method methodology, the analysis, as well as the advocacy to the um, policymakers. Uh, and also from our discussion, uh, we could see that uh, how the studies um, capture various insightful information to inform our policymakers in defining a more, designing a more fit um, policies or programs. Uh, so, I, Mirza Izati, on behalf of Smeru, thank you for thank you for coming today or watching us on live streaming and contributing to this discussion. Uh, we hope we hope that you found the discussion informative and that it has provided you with an in-depth insight of the issue. So, and then I'm glad to inform you that we will have another, not another, uh, more five more forums in the next three weeks uh, in the same place. Uh, you can find the details on Smeru website, www.smeru.or.id, and you can type FKP 2017. Um, okay, uh, thank you, and we'll be happy to see you again here next week. Uh, before we left, uh, Pa Asep will give the souvenirs to Peter and Julia. Thank you. Uh, for the participant, you can. Thank you. Uh, okay, so for the participant, you can help yourself have their lunch over there.